were uh, published because, of course, first, we didn't have time or resources to use all of them. And second, as Western newspapers, um, we were more interested in some issues. Our readers were more interested in some subjects. And we ignored or discarded other cables, which would be much more interesting, for instance, for Indian newspapers or Latin American or, or African newspapers. Uh, so it was, I think it was an excellent decision to spread the, um, the cables to, to more uh, newspaper across the world after that. And they did their own redaction after that. I don't know about what happened later. So um, is, are you satisfied with this? Yeah, okay. that's great. Yeah, thank so you. I, I'll go back now then to the, the, the uh, subject of the panel, which is uh, uh, did WikiLeaks... Um, uh, help a rebirth of uh, investigative journalism. I must say I was a little bit puzzled by this uh, question uh, because to me, in the beginning, um, WikiLeaks was about whistleblowing more than about journalism. So, of course, there's a link between the two, but it's a different activities at the beginning. To me, investigative journalism is more like what Nick Davis of The Guardian, for instance, uh, has done over the past three years, which is... Um, uh, painstaking investigation and digging about this uh, phone hacking scandal to finally expose it and, and, and shake uh, uh, the Murdoch empire. But um, it's, a, it's a legitimate question, so, and I'm a disciplined person, though I'm French, and so I will, I will uh, address it. So first, um, maybe we should um, wonder what has WikiLeaks changed in, um, in the way we do our job which is, um, after all, at the end of the day, our job is about um, not crawling up uh, the ladder of power, but bringing news in the open, including news which is not supposed to come out in the open. I would say WikiLeaks has changed both a lot and not much. A lot, um, I, I read the other day a piece by David Carr in the New York Times which, which said, and that I think Julian will like it, um, David Carr said, WikiLeaks changed the face of journalism and the entire informational ecosystem. It sounds a bit like an overstatement, but in a way, um, uh, it is true. Uh, Julian Assange had two great ideas, I think. First, the first one was to set up a safe box, an electronic box for whistleblowers, where they would be, where they were supposed to be able to um, um, drop their documents without uh, being identified. And the second great idea, though I think he, he came to regret it, but I think it was a very important idea to seek the cooperation of mainstream media, both for their audiences, for their expertise, and also for the credibility it, uh, it would bring to the documents. Um, and it is true that I think that if those documents had at first been just dropped on a website, first there was the issue of security about the redaction, uh, be because of the redaction of the cables. Uh, but if they had been dropped just on a website run by WikiLeaks, I don't think it would have had the same impact as it did the way it was managed, this publication was managed by stages and with the expertise and analysis of, of, uh, of uh, mainstream journalists. So WikiLeaks represents a new tactical advance for whistleblowers and leaks, and it's, in that sense, it's a major tool for uh, As a side effect, it also opened a debate. The publication of those cables also opened a debate in some countries about transparency. And I, um, I talk about France, particularly, where we don't have a Freedom of Information Act. Um, there was a vigorous and, and sometimes uh, uh, a little bit radical, but quite healthy debate about transparency, uh, thanks to those uh, cables. I said a lot and not much. Not much, because in the end, it failed, uh, in WikiLeaks failed uh, to protect the whistleblower. I mean, whether Bradley Manning is or is not uh, the, the whistleblower in this case, his misfortune is definitely a very powerful deterrent the way he is being treated. 
um, in, in, uh, in an American prison will definitely serve as a deterrent for potential future whistleblowers. And um, another consequence is that the, uh, this uh, um, publication of, of cables led uh, governments and companies to improve uh, their safety systems. I'm, I'm pretty sure now uh, that the <laughs> US government has a better way of uh, protecting uh, the secrecy of its uh, diplomatic cables, but not only the diplomatic cables, I'm sure. Um, and as uh, Julian has described, Wikileaks itself is now paralyzed by financial sex sanctions. Uh, I, I do think that the, the the measures taken by Visa, MasterCard, and PayPal, and, and, and the others are, are extreme, are really extreme. And so, but as, as a matter of fact, WikiLeaks can't function anymore. And so these, those financial sanctions for, plus the personal problems of Julian Assange, um, make that, you know, this experience has come to a, to a halt. Um, so governments and corporations have successfully counterattacked. I think we can say that. And uh, uh, no leaks have, no major leaks have happened since then. Some, some media uh, have established, have opened their own uh, leaks sites and their own uh, uh, systems for uh, welcoming, you know, for to to have. Uh, um, for whistleblowers, but I don't think that any major leak has happened since, uh, you know, for instance, the Wall Street Journal, I haven't heard that uh, anything uh, uh, important has uh, been received. So where does this leave us with, uh, with um, investigative journalism? I think there are three lessons to be drawn, and I will uh, finish quickly with this. Uh, the first lesson is the indispensable alliance between digital tools and mainstream media. Uh, this morning's panel on, on data journalism uh, and, and particularly Joy Ito uh, really underlined this point and I think it's a very powerful argument. But we are only at the beginning. I mean, in, I know there are uh, quite a lot of geeks here, but in the mainstream media, as Julian called them, or in the old-fashioned media, whatever you call them, we, we desperately need training on this. Uh, we're, we're just starting to, to uh, get familiar with those tools and, and only a very small minority usually in our websites. So there's a lot of uh, um, ground to cover. I think tomorrow we're going to hear Paul Steiger of ProPublica Pro on this and I, I'm really looking forward to it because he's been doing something extremely interesting. He set up a newsroom where he has uh, traditional journalists, mainstream journalists, with very classic journalistic uh, tools and skills, and new, and, and sorry, uh, young, a whole team of young guys and, 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 uh, and girls who uh, are technologically savvy, who are very good at all this, and the old ones teach the, the young ones, and, and the young ones teach the old ones, and I think the mix is exactly what we all need. Um, uh, lesson two, the old tools still serve. Thanks to, thanks to the internet and new technologies, we now have, we may have access to massive amounts of data, uh, not only secret ones, but public ones also. This is a whole new uh, ball game uh, compared to the time of the Pentagon Papers, for instance, but what do we do with those data? We have these mountains of, of uh, uh, data now accessible. What do you do with two? 250,000 cables. So when you're uh, faced with this amount of data, you need two things. You need excellent computer experts, people who can help you with search engines and, and, and all these kind of, of, of tools. Uh, and second thing, you need skilled, good journalists to select, to analyze, in, in a word, to bring meaning to, to those data. Uh, I, I, the other day, I saw the, some time ago, I saw on the data blog of the, of the Guardian, there was this, uh, during the um, Libyan war, there was this interactive map of um, NATO attacks in Libya, which is extremely impressive. Uh, and even, I mean, really, really nice, uh, nice stuff. And there was the comment of one reader. The first comment was, am I expected to believe this? 
well, yeah, if you only have the data, how can the average reader believe or understand? You know, he needs expert and he needs journalists to help him make sense of all this information. And lesson three, and that's the last one, I agree with Julian Assange on this. Transparency is still an uphill battle. Um, to, and the tools are being used by both sides. We benefit from the technology, from the data, from crowdsourcing, from whatever, and it's wonderful. These are beautiful tools that we, we are going to use more and more. But these tools are also used by the other side to fight against transparency, to protect the secrecy. And I'm not talking only about dictatorships and authoritarian regimes, but democratic regimes like France are very, very jealous of their secret. The state secrets in France are very well protected. So um, this is really a battle we, we still have to, to carry. We, it's, a, it's a costly battle in terms of money. We, it's a secret for uh, nobody here, I think, that investigative journalism has lost a lot as the economic crisis has, has struck uh, um, the media. We, you know, investigation costs money and we do less when we have uh, fewer reporters and fewer resources. And, and we also need fighting spirit. And, and at Le Monde, we've sued the French government for violation of confidentiality of journalistic uh, sources. And we just very recently got the head of the intelligence service charged for that. So I think this is a battle we can, we can, uh, um, we can carry. And to use somebody else's motto, yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvie. So, uh, because Julian's speech was longer than, uh, than expected, um, I, I propose that Lee uh, speaks until uh, 7. And, and then Janina until 7.15, and then if you are not uh, dead, uh, questions until 7.30, and then Context. you are free. Context. Then a speech from Mr. Pecri that you will have to, to listen to, because there is not freedom everywhere. Would you like... I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. You would like to ask questions now? Okay, so let, let's... Uh, Lee, would you like to... Let, let's, let's change and ask Lee to, to talk about economic, investigative... Uh, no, let, let, let's change because I think, uh, Janina, you are going to talk about WikiLeaks again. No? No, no, no. no not at all? No. Whoever wants to speak. <laughs> or maybe the two of you at the same time, one in Spanish, one in Chinese. Ah, okay. For a battery problem, Janina comes first. I had to fight a lot to be allowed to use my own computer. Ha. Um, but mean, in the meanwhile, well, they connect the. My presentation is not about WikiLeaks, although, although we worked with the WikiLeaks cable in Central America. We did Costa Rica and Nicaragua as well, and uh, it was a very interesting um, task. We worked 24/7 uh, reading the cables, do it, doing text mining to understand what was in, and we developed software, special software, to process, index, and long, long story. And we did investigative, investigative journalism out of the information that we got, not just uh, releasing cables, because that's not investigative journalism. But I won't talk about WikiLeaks anymore. I, I am here because I want to share with you um, 
a project that I've been working on during the last year, and uh, it's about data journalism. Okay. And, uh, and I hope you're not really hungry, because I'll be talking about food and cooking. And, and uh, this is the best way I found to explain what we are doing. And it's a very unique project, I would say, in the world. I didn't know until recently that we are the only ones in the world doing this sort of thing. And not computer-assisted reporting, because as you know, that's very old, and um, statistical reporting as well. But uh, what we are doing, well, first of all, the uh, similarity between cooking and data journalism is that you need ingredients, kitchen tools, and talent, and of course, creativity to cook. But you need data programs and talent and creativity uh, for, to do data journalism. And I will compare both in three different levels. I'll be very short. In level one, you have a stove, and so you basically um, have ingredients and cook uh, roasted chicken with uh, the chicken, of course, oil and some spices. Uh, but the day after, if you have no creativity, all you will have is uh, leftovers. And, well, that's the best scenario because otherwise your pet will have the chicken. In level one, in, in database journalism, you have a great idea and to cook a plate, and this is not an idea. We actually published this story last December, and it was we were we were having regional elections uh, in Costa Rica, so we got the whole data database of candidates who were running for mayor, mayors, and uh, we we got that, which is the whole database, like 1,500 uh, people, and we got the whole da database of criminal court records and also got the, uh, another data set of people who were forbidden to occupy public positions, and uh, another one that is people who are not paying taxes. So we got the whole thing, and basically we used the software to clean, filter, index, and then cross-reference the data, and uh, the outcome was really interesting. One week before the elections, and I, lo I love this job because uh, especially this uh, publication, because it's what I call prophylactic journalism. We run the story one week before the elections, and we found out that there were five guys who were sentenced of kidnapping, fraud, and robbery who were running for mayors. And not just that, there were 27 who had been forbidden to occupy public positions, and even though they were nominated. So, well, this is the story, and um, of course we... Uh, build a map in which people could go and find their own region angels <laughs> and, and, every, and the whole original documents that we got. Uh, but yes, it was such a nice uh, uh, publication, but even the story was great. If we just do that and we don't reuse information, for me, that's waste. And it's like uh, food for the pets. There's a level two in which you, in cooking, have more tools. Then you have a mixer, a microwave, and more other things. And then you start to think differently also, not just the tools. But you think, oh, during the weekend I may cook a red curry sauce or potle sauce. And during the weekdays I could use the chicken, remember the chicken? Uh, and cook a chicken quesadilla or maybe a very exotic Thai salad. In level two in data-based journalism, as I see it, we have no leftovers. And this is the part in which we are doing different. Because there are many journalists using data sets, but they just use the data and, and that's it. They never use it again. So for me, any data set is a new ingredient. So. Uh, if we got the criminal court records, we have to run more and more stories on that. So what if we compare this database with the active teachers, for instance? We can find active teachers who have been sentenced of pedophilia, for instance. 
Or uh, people who are not paying taxes, they shouldn't be getting co uh, government contracts. And that's another question, that you can reuse the same data set. Uh, but there's a level three, and I'm not a cooker, don't think that, I, <laughs> that I'm a chef or something like that, but uh, molecular gastronomy is a really uh, interesting field. And uh, you know this uh, fancy toy, it's called a smoking gun. And what it does is that you fill it with uh, mesquite wood chips, well, any other kind of wood, and you smoke the chicken. So uh, the chicken tastes as wood. Uh, so you now not only have the whole supermarket uh, with products, traditional products, but you also have the forest. Um, and well, what they do is that they apply scientific uh, methods to see what, what's going on while you cook, the, the chemistry of cooking. In journalism, uh, using data, what I, what I think is that there is this zero-waste data journalism in which you can imagine all these data sets not just reused but linked to each other. And that's what we have been doing. For the last year we've gathered uh, databases, public databases, not private information, about uh, every single thing you can imagine. We have uh, ships, vehicles, uh, companies, aircraft, uh, lawyers, teachers, any kind of professionals. And we have uh, subsidies, licenses, licenses uh, contracts by the government. So uh, we have um, consolidated the data in a server. And we are using a software that uh, until recently was only used by law enforcement agencies, which is called I2. I don't know how many of you use it or have... Uh, hear about that, but it's the one, uh, it's used by the FBI, CIA, and until recently it's been sold uh, to third parties like us. Uh, well, they, they really investigate, investigate you before selling you uh, the software. It's really expensive. And this is how it looks. Uh, this is a, a video of a query uh, in the, our server that uh, basically what, what I'm doing here is asking uh, I have everything I, I told you before uh, in, in this, uh, stored in this server, and I'm asking uh, the software to give me a person who has a private license to be um, a guard, uh, like a private police guy. They need a, a license from the government, and so I, I'm telling the software, give me people who have uh, pr this kind of license and who have been involved in a judiciary case between this and this date. So that way I make sure that so it's just a query. But what I'm getting here is people who have been sentenced of any crime in, uh, and who are working actively as, a, as private uh, vigilants or, or security guards. And uh, well, it's a ah, wall, but not just that. You can be part of a judiciary case, uh, not being a defendant. You can actually be the one who, who is complaining. So I'm asking it to uh, bring me only the people who have been a defendant and who have been found guilty. And then there you are. Uh, those are the names and I can expand it and visualize the information in a map. Uh, I will skip the rest of the query, but basically, well, this is what we, we get whenever we make a query. And this is not just for long-term investigations. Whenever we have a name, we expand it and we can see if they have uh, properties, uh, any, any information we, we have stored in the server. And as I see it, there's a level four for um, database journalism, journalism, which is global data sharing. Just imagine that all of us in our countries have something similar like this, and we can share the information. I may have in my, in my da databases information about people that, I, uh, that could be relevant for you in, in the, same, uh, the same way, vice versa. So this is just an idea that I, uh, that I think it may occur at some point. Uh, our team, well, is, we are basically three uh, journalists, uh, two computer science engineers, 
Uh, and this is the way we are gathering the, the information. We um, scrape the web 24-7. The web We're scraping data from the web uh, with robots. And uh, that's one, one source. And the other one, we go to the institutions and ask for the databases. And also, we download information from web services. Or, or, and then we load and consolidate the data. Uh, and this is the analysis part, which is really important because there is when you play with the data and you find amazing things that, are, that, that otherwise you would never know. Uh, but for me, this is the most important part, and I will finish soon. It's why should we do this? Why? Not, the how I could explain uh, more details later on. But first of all, for me, to overcome the filtration dependence. Uh, second, to fulfill the thirst of value. And then, because I'm pretty sure that this is a business model itself. Uh, first reason, well, last night while we were all sleeping, there were things going on, if you think, uh, all over the world, in your neighborhood, in your countries. And over the time, there will be somebody who come with a piece, and that happens every single day in every newsroom. They come with a piece because some, he or she is interested in giving you this piece because he was not paid a commission or whatever reason. The point is that if we work really hard and collect more pieces, we will tell a great story. Uh, but uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, think about this, but what about the missing pieces? Could they have uh, changed the whole story? Uh, we will never know, because we're working like uh, rabbits, chasing a carrot, basically. And this is how we look. Uh, if we only work uh, based on filtration. Because there are many experts in seducing our supposedly sense of smell. We think we do have sense of smell. But they, are, they know how to use us. So um, that's the first, re first reason. The second one is to fulfill the thirst of value. As you know, and I won't talk too much about this, there, uh, there's too much data on the, uh, available, 800 exabytes, and this is the conversion. And uh, it, the web is really noisy. The, there is too much data, too much aggregation, and less intelligent information. And we editors are more worried about the, uh, you know, achieve the goal of real-time news, which is okay. I'm not criticizing that. But in that uh, hurry, uh, I think we're forgetting about the content, which is the most important thing. And so uh, our model basically uh, is based uh, on the content is the only thing that adds value. Uh, and this is the virtual circle that we all know, in which uh, quality content is uh, warranties credibility. And as you know, credibility captures more audience. And audience attracts advertising. And advertising brings money and money pays for independence. And then the virtual circles go on and on. Uh, now we have more opportunities. Uh, according to McKinsey, uh, big data or, or data is the next frontier for innovation, competition, and productivity. And as you know, it's called, uh, it's a capital resource, uh, like human resource. And there are many opportunities here that I won't mention, but basically we can anticipate behavior uh, there are emotional data metrics right now, uh, and, and there are many op uh, doors open. But the question for me must be, does any other opportunities enhance credibility? Um, so we see news as, a, as, a, in, as an investment portfolio in which we are still working on filt filtration, uh, but we are doing data-driven journalism, which is more based on statistical data and database journalism. And well, here is kind of a, the idea of the value that each one adds. Uh, and of course, all this is based on an out output of visualization. And this is the last one. Uh, there has been many obstacles, like, for instance, adaptation of journalists working together with the developers. This is really fun. And verification. We got 400 uh, candidates who were involved in, in, in something. So we had to call them. We are still doing traditional good 
journalism. We have to call them and ask for their version. So we had to set up a, basically a call center to call all these guys. But I never thought about this part of the equation. <laughs> and this has been a, a real. And the other one is data actualization. That uh, it, it's, uh, once you get a data set, the day after, it, it's, it's not the same. <laughs> you have to, to find ways to keep uh, upgraded the information. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deep and visual uh, presentation. I, I hope you didn't check my criminal records because you are pretty <laughs> severe. The, um, are you taking this mic or, or this one? Whatever, whatever you like. Do I, I have a presentation, but I will be on this computer. Okay, whatever you like. I don't know where that is. Do you think we could get the, the bio of the... Because I didn't think we, we got um, Giannina's bio before. Maybe we could have both of them in a row. Oh, yeah, that's true. But I don't know where my presentation is. Presentation is okay. It's on. Okay. But it's not on. Okay. All right. Let's start. No, we're good. Um, so I know I'm the last speaker of a very long day, I'm s and I'm standing between you and the cocktail, so I'll be very short. And um, after, re after the very beautiful presentation from my panelist, I think it's a tremendous pressure on me, but I'm going to come back to the topic of WikiLeaks and why there's lack of that in China. Um, Julian Assange has mentioned a little bit that uh, in his speech about China, but basically this is how WikiLeaks was covered in China. It's a personal story. It's about Julian Assange and all the juicy details about his private life as well as the organization instead of the content that he actually brings to light. But why is that so? I think the reason is not hard to understand. Number one is the WikiLeaks uh, website is blocked in China a few years ago, and the WikiLeaks information has not ha received very little coverage from mainstream media simply because that will be filtered or censored. And the Wiki, on the other hand, I think the WikiLeaks effect actually cannot challenge the use of traditional investigative journalism in China for several reasons. Number one is um, WikiLeaks is possible based on several big eaves. One is the sheer amount of available data in the public space that people can make use of when you ha talk about the direct material, and which doesn't really, uh, in China, the sheer amount of data available in the public space is not um, same in quantity. Let's putting this way, uh, compared to other countries like the United States. And also, it depends on a legal infrastructure that actually can protect journalistic activities, although Julian Assange has many complaints about that, but the story, obviously, is much more difficult in China. And so, scaling back, instead of WikiLeaks, uh, what other things we can do with, as an investigative journalist in China, actually, we haven't made full use of existing resources, and why is that so? Um, in 2008, there was a Government Information Disclosure Act passed by the government. That was definitely heavily uh, covered by most of the media in China as a positive step forward for transparency in the government and official information. But guess what? Three years since the implementation of this very important law, zero cases have been filed by any journalist or media organization against the government for not disclosing any of the information. And why is that so? Number one is because it's a tedious, very long waiting, and also because you will face a lot of closed doors if you do that. Uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences conducted a survey last year, the last two months of last year, uh, about 43 city governments and 59 institutions affiliated with the State Council, which is Chinese cabinet. 
And out of the final uh, application for disclosure of some environment-related information, and guess what? Out of the, all the institutions and the city governments, um, probably 80% actually have web application portal that people can submit their application. And less, probably less than 20 of them actually replied to the application, and less than 5% actually disclosed the information that they are seeking. And again, this is the survey conducted by one of Ch uh, China's leading academic institution and also about something less political, which is environment. Of course, environment is important as well, but they chose the topic very uh, uh, carefully. So this is how hard it is to knock on the door on the government to forward the information. And having said that no journalist or no media has filed a case against the government. That means nobody has filed that with the journalist credential, but there is a lone fighter of, this is the guy so far, the only person that has filed a lawsuit against the government, local Shanghai government, against, uh, uh, to um, get access to information. But he did, he is a journalist, but did that, he did that on his, uh, as an individual citizen instead of journalist. And he did that for five years. He did that twice, about two different pieces of information. And he was, number one, removed from his previous post to a very marginal job within the newspaper he worked, which um, is called Jiefang Daily. And he received personal threat and he was beaten up, as well as uh, his case was turned down by the court and he lost his appeal again. So that's the long fighter so far. And so basically, why is that so? Because uh, there is lack of journalism legislation in China to protect the journalist activities, be that from uh, journalists with credentials or civ civic journalists. Uh, also, there is weak rule of law, as you may know. But to offset that, what we see increasingly um, as a um, uh, positive sign is media industry solidarity, as well as the public pressure. Peter and y uh, Yolanda, as well as um, Bob, talked so extensively about Weibo this morning, so I don't have to explain the, uh, the, the concept to you again, but the Chinese counterpart Twitter is really the game changer where, which you can, uh, on which platform you can gather the public opinion, and uh, that will be, uh, that is actually a very uh, influential um, public opinion, public pressure to the, to the government. So what implications WikiLeaks have on traditional media, like the session media that I'm working with? Um, we've been trying some of the things, like publishing the direct, uh, the, the direct evidence, as well as using cross-sourcing on Weibo. One example is the story published early this year that is about the orphan story happened in one of Chinese provinces. Um, Starting from 2000, before 2006, uh, the local family planning agencies took away babies from more than 10 families and labeled them as orphans, and the, it eventually ended up in adoption families in the United States and Netherlands. And the money paid by the uh, U.S. families and uh, Dutch families actually ended up split between the family, agent, pl family planning agency as well as the uh, orphanage. So this kind of story is definitely groundbreaking and that has a um, huge impact, not just within China, but also in, in the, uh, internationally. So what we did with that is we published all the evidence we collected on the website and that is one of the protections we have because we know the, uh, the consequences we're gonna face and definitely the local government will come back uh, uh, looking for us and there are possible repercussions. So we have to make our case as solid as possible and one way of doing that is just simply publishing all the evidence we have on hand. We even, uh, pub we even put on our website the, uh, some of the actual uh, recording of the interview, of course, with the consensus of the interviewee. And also on the English part of our website, we use the citizen journalism, we crowdsourcing, we put on the pictures, pictures of the babies. And a lot of our international audiences were looking, international readers were looking for whereabouts of these babies now. But having said that, the story becomes success not because we used any of the new media platform or used any of the civic journalism tools. It's simply because we published the story and our investigative reporter has done 
the homework, has done the work of the investigation throughout, um, the, mat throughout the matter of four years. And after he completed, completed most of the investigation, he actually took the story to several different uh, media organizations. He didn't, uh, he didn't work with us until this year. And no one actually published the story, even though that's a scoop, but they just didn't, um, because national uh, the family planning is a national policy, and people didn't, uh, other publishers probably uh, were too afraid to challenge the national policy. So at one point, actually, the reporter was willing to give up the story to someone else. But, and again, uh, re other journalists took the story and tried to run with the paper and failed. So the secret behind the success of this story is simply because the reporter has done a very thorough reporting, and also we took the risk of publishing that instead of using all the social, the, using all the social media is nice, but in China that pales in comparison still with the uh, shared access to information and as well as the uh, solid reporting and um, good news judgment and political judgment. So technology is actually changing journalism in terms of access to information and the means that we can present the information, but on the end of the day, it's still good protection of journalistic activities and very good um, content that actually can make us stand um, in, in the field and in, the, in, in, in this industry. So with that, I'll end my presentation and I'm, willing to, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. It's great. So uh, let's go for a 10-minute session of questions, and if you have more questions, we'll take the mics and have the cocktail and the questions and more questions just next door. Mr. President, do you agree? I do. Excellent. I know you always, always agree on wines. Yes, first question. The WikiLeaks and his speech in the session uh, which ha it's, a, it's a comment. Uh, he is not treated well in this house. The way we, you have raised the issues, questions to him, not even admitting him as a journalist, and uh, the way the comments were made afterwards. What I'm saying is, my basic thrust is, that WikiLeaks has expanded the horizon of right to know uh, tremendously and unprecedentedly. It, uh, where is the limit to right to know? WikiLeaks has done and achieved that thing in just with one click of the mouse. Now, there is no boundary, there is no limit on the right to know. It has expanded, whether we accept, accept it or not, whether we become uh, very pragmatic or legalistic or reductionist in terms of allowing people the right to know. So that is the first thing uh, which should have been debated here, which we have not been, despite being the journalists from the mainstream media and uh, editors from the mainstream media. The second is that we are still suffering from the stereotypes, that who is the journalist? We have been telling that journalism is just storytelling. And which organization in the world, in the mainstream media, can compete with WikiLeaks in terms of uh, uh, in terms of ex uh, stories, exclusive stories, and in terms of scoops. Hundreds of scoops, thousands of exclusive stories there, and all the pa newspapers of the world and media outlets filled with those stories. And still we say, okay, was it a, a really investigative journalism or not? Or was it, it the issue of the whistleblower? And we are not even talking about the right of the whistleblower who is suffering now in uh, US prison. What I'm saying is, that uh, we, the, 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 we so-called media, uh, mainstream media, should be respecting the effort of the WikiLeaks that it has opened, uh, it has expanded the horizon of right to know, and it has expanded the horizon of freedom of expression. Instead of being very skeptical, or instead of being very, uh, very, uh, very, very patronizing about the, about the parallel media, or the informal media, or the media on the net, or the citizen journalism. The discussion we were having in the morning session was also quite patronizing about citizen journalism. 
we don't accept the standards. We are the people who are the standard bearers, who set the standards, who are the leader, who set the guidelines. And these youngsters who are very immature in the language and expressions and formats and who do not accept any kind of format, they are not. They should accept our guidelines. They will not. Rather, they will be setting. In fact, there should be some change of relationship. The new media is setting the new standards or anti-standards, uh, if you call it, that uh, even if you don't accept, that is vibrant, that is spreading, even if you don't accept it. Thank you. Sir. Ah, okay. Okay, so, so Julian uh, is still listening. So... Um, no, not yet. Uh, any question? And to whom? Uh, is someone... Okay, I, I'm going to do the... Thank you. I was just... You know, uh, Wikileaks has done a great uh, re revelations about what happened in Iraq and other conflict area like in Afghanistan. But my personal experience in op you know, relatively open countries like Indonesia, actually we didn't get anything. What is basically just a, a report from the embassies about hearsays, which we all already know any, anyway. Uh, so I was just wondering whether the impact of WikiLeaks happened mostly in conflict areas or uh, you know, uh, countries which is very close in 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 in, in uh, keeping its information. Did you take the question, Sylvie? Uh, yes, it, it is true that it uh, the impact was bigger in countries where there was no freedom of expression, and um, so it was more difficult to get to know the what really happened. Uh, so we learned things. Or, or even in some countries like Morocco or Tunisia or Egypt, uh, I think there were things that we knew existed, but in fact, the f you know, we got confirmation or we got new details in those cables. But in, in for instance, on France, it was anecdotal. Uh, you know, there were impressions or judgments from the American diplomats about our political class, and it was amusing, but there was nothing really uh, politically new. Maybe on Berlusconi there was, uh, there was interesting stuff, but otherwise it's, well, it was more on either dictatorships or zones of conflict, I agree, yeah. Yes, you've got the mic, good. Yeah. So again, that's a question to you. I, I know it's, a, it's not an easy, I'm Alexei Nikolov, I'm managing editor of RT, Russia Today. And Julian is also uh, close to us. He gave us a few interviews. Uh, you, you don't think there was a bit of a contradiction here? Well, and, and I think Julian intentionally, purposely made us, uh, brought our attention to the fact that he is a journalist and he worked as a part of journalistic network. What happens is that as long he addressed mass media, a number of media, not just yours, in the hope to become a part of that and also to get a sort of protection that we enjoy and may understand that this is a part of the solidarity thing. However, as soon as he gets into trouble, everyone seems to desert him. And even it's, I mean, let me complain. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to be personal or something. It's really a question. I know it's not easy. Uh, he made a point, a strong point about choosing the definitions. And he says, what those financial institutions are doing is illegal. Now you're saying it's extreme. There's a fine difference uh, between that. And I don't think any of us, including us, I don't think any of us has made a real huge story of this absolutely artificial case uh, against him in Sweden. Uh, I don't think any of us has really covered that. And we all, as a, as a journalistic community, deserted him in a way. You don't feel so? Um, I, I don't think we deserted him. Uh, we, in Le Monde, we published a front page editorial in defense of him. Uh, he was our man of the year last year, and in December we put his uh, face on the cover of our magazine and we ran a, really a, a, quite a number of stories about uh, him and what he did with Wikileaks. So I don't think 
and I don't think we are the only paper to have done so. I mean, he does have a conflict with The Guardian and The New York Times. I'm not, you know, this is something beyond my, my control. Um, now, I think you have a point about the, not about the Swedish case, which we have covered, and, and including in, in legal details, but um, about the, the financial institutions, the, Amer the American banks and financial institutions which uh, blacklisted him and are blacklisting um, WikiLeaks. Yeah, maybe we could do more about this. I